Good morning, my friends. This is Pastor Stephen Brooks. Welcome today to Morning Glory, our midweek Bible study. And I'm so glad that you're here today. Praise the Lord. Let's take our Bibles this morning and go over to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 12. And today I want to talk about seeing my pets in heaven. Woo! Praise the Lord. So let's jump into some visionary experiences that God has granted me, and I believe that you will be blessed. Praise the Lord. Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we go into your word, we ask that your Holy Spirit would bring wisdom and revelation concerning the beauty of your kingdom and the goodness of your heart and your loving kindness, and your tender mercies. Now, we thank you for your Holy Spirit making this manifest in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, and together we say amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 3. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had had bought and nourished, And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. My friends, there's something about these little animals, these little pets, whether in this case, like a little lamb, which is something that Nathan the prophet is using as a story to grab David's attention. And trust me, it really grabbed his attention because David was a shepherd. So he could relate tremendously with the story being presented to him. But whether it's a a lamb, kitty cat, or puppy dog, or whatever it might be, whatever the type of animal, uh, even a bird, I tell you, these little creatures have a way of grabbing a hold of our hearts and what could be a household pet becomes a uh, like an extended member of the family. It's, uh, it's like a tremendous love that can form. And I know that for some, when their pets die, there, have, there are some people that they love that little animal so much that they can go into a depression, into a grief, and some actually have a very hard time pulling out of that because maybe, you know, you have family members and you love them. And of course, if a family member gets older and passes away, you feel sorrow and you miss that person. But perhaps the person wasn't really that close to you. And perhaps maybe uh, they were distant and you didn't, uh, even though you're blood related, you just didn't really connect heart to heart. But yet that little pet was in your house 24-7, maybe sleeping in the bed at night with you. And when that little animal grew older and then died, it's like, wow, I tell you what, it can really hit you really, really hard. So I want to talk about these things today because as believers, we actually have a supernatural hope. Praise God. Because we are living for eternity in the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. So let's talk about some of these things today. And I actually felt led of the Holy Spirit to share some of my testimonies of having been taken to heaven. And I'm, when I say that, I'm not talking about a dream or some kind of a fabricated experience. These are all genuine, valid visions that God gave to me. And I actually saw uh, heaven. I was there in my spirit. I was taken there. My body was on the earth, but my spirit was taken to heaven. I have been allowed to walk around certain parts of heaven, certain parts of paradise, which is an outer part uh, that's um, like a gigantic park bigger than our planet. And it's really, uh, uh, there, it's so big that you can't see it all. It's going to take a lot of time for us to get familiar with it when we get to heaven. But I want to tell you uh, some things that I have seen while I have been in heaven. And today we're talking about specifically pets in heaven. Woo! Praise the Lord. Well, let's go to a very famous verse that many of us know. I think there's a lot of Christians that know it, but not necessarily perhaps all of them believe it. A lot of people like to spiritualize things when they are meant to be taken literally. Revelation chapter 19, 
Let's begin in verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with the robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now verse 14, this, this uh, applies to you very, very closely. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Woo, praise God. You know, I remember the time that my wife and I and our youngest daughter, Abigail, we went to the Biltmore Estate here in North Carolina, in Asheville. It's one of America's biggest tourist attractions because it's such a beautiful facility. But they also have a, uh, a trail hike that you can do. A lot of, not, of, uh, not many of the visitors know about it, but you can actually go on their horses and um, they can take about 10 to 15 people on horseback and they can take you back into the further acreage that the Biltmore owns. And so you get away from the crowds and you get to go back and see all of the beautiful land that is owned. And it's a very, very nice ride. Well, they have, you know, uh, only a certain amount of horses. They're very well taken care of, but there were two that were unique. And of course, when our group was there, everybody's eyes go towards two particular horses. And the, the guide said, okay, we do have two special horses. One of them uh, used to be a wild Mustang. Now, for those of you familiar with the North Carolina coast, we have beautiful mountains, but we also have the coast and we have the Outer Banks, which is a, uh, like a streak of islands that are just off the coast. And uh, that's actually where the wild Mustang came from. Back in the 1500s, there was a Spanish ship that crashed. And I'm not sure what happened to the men. I think they got picked up later by another ship. But all the horses back in the 1500s got stranded on this one island. That was actually called Mustang Island. But the horses would actually swim from island to island. And today, they actually walk around on certain parts of the Outer Banks, and uh, they are the wild Spanish Mustangs. Well, out of everybody there that day, um, the only one person was going to get the ride, the Mustang, and it just so fell by how we had just randomly all lined up, because we didn't know who's going to get what. Well, my daughter got the Mustang. <laughs> so uh, she was real happy about that. But I was real happy also because they only had one white horse. Guess who got the white horse? <laughs> I got the ride on the white horse. I, I felt like I was identifying with uh, verse 14, maybe seeing into the future a little bit. Praise God. But it was a lot of fun. But my friends, there are uh, some preachers even who, surprisingly enough, I've actually heard some really good ones say that there's no animals in heaven. And sometimes you can't help but uh, scratch your head and think, wow, the person has a PhD in uh, theology. They speak uh, English. They, they are learned in Greek and Hebrew. And yet it seems like they can't uh, read the Bible. <laughs> What's going on? Well, Pastor Stephen, those aren't real horses. Well, well, sure they are. That's a real Jesus riding on a real horse. And we will be real redeemed saints riding on horses when we come back. Wow, praise the Lord. There's some interim things, of course, that happen, but that's going to take place. And, you know, it is it is strange because now I've actually heard a few other ministers say that, well, there could be animals in heaven, but if there are, there's probably only horses. <laughs> and so it's, it's, just, it's very interesting the way that people think. It's like going to New York City, where millions of people live in a city, Yet maybe you were in, in an area, say like Manhattan, where all the skyscrapers are at, and you didn't see any dogs. And so therefore, it would be like making a proclamation, I have been to New York City, and I saw no dogs. Well, hold on just a minute. Just because you didn't see them there does not mean that they aren't there, because trust me, uh, they are there. And I've been to the, you know, the big park. Um, you know, various times, and there's dogs, there's dogs galore, dogs on rocks, dogs on the grass, dogs all over the place. <laughs> so Grand Central Park, yes, very beautiful place. Kelly and I enjoy walking through there. But just because you didn't see them, maybe in one spot, doesn't mean that they're not there. 
That's kind of like the same argument that I've heard some people say about uh, angels don't have names. Can you believe that? I've actually heard some ministers say that angels don't have names. And if you ask them why, they say, well, only Michael and Gabriel have names. <laughs> and so you're thinking, okay, so the other billions of angels they're walking around in heaven and nobody knows who each other is. They, there, there's no name. There's not even a name tag. <laughs> Look, just because only two are mentioned with their actual names does not mean that the others don't have names. All you have to do with some of this stuff and just kind of stop and just, and just think. <laughs> so yes, my friends, there are animals in heaven. Uh, actually, animals galore. Uh, I'll, I'll even go further a little bit later on, but even all of the um, animals that have gone extinct, they are also in a certain area of paradise. And um, now paradise used to be in the center of the earth. That's where the Old Testament saints were at until Jesus came. And after his death, he went down into the center of the earth. There was a, there was the area of Hades and there was the area of paradise. And there was a chasm that nobody could cross over. Well, he took the old Testament saints and that area of paradise out. And, um, when he ascended on high Ephesians chapter four, he took captivity captive. And, uh, so all of the old Testament saints, of course, are in heaven. All of the saints who have died in the Lord are in heaven. There are some ministers that teach when you die, you go into the grave. That's not true. When you die, your physical body, you're going to put that in the grave, but to be absent from the body is to be where? It's to be present with the Lord. So the moment any born again believer dies, their, their physical body would fall to the earth or lay there in the bed or wherever it is where the person died, but immediately their spirit and their soul go to be with the Lord in heaven. Praise God. This is all, this is all very interesting. I've, um, I've talked with some ministers and uh, sometimes you have to feel things out because you can't, you can't share too much around some people because they, um, they go tilt. They, uh, they don't have a scriptural paradigm, uh, a, a faith to experience certain things that rightfully belong to us. Uh, visions, supernatural encounters are the inheritance of for God's people, for the saints. They have been happening even in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Uh, we, get the, we get the full thing. We get all the gifts of the Spirit. We get tongues also and interpretation of tongues. But all the, of these supernatural encounters, that is a portion, a part of our inheritance. So sometimes I've uh, talked to certain ministers and who've, uh, uh, some of them have had heavenly encounters, and uh, they would play it real safe. They would say things like, when I was in heaven, I saw angels. Well, sometimes when I'm around them, I ask them, what else did you see? Well, I, Pastor Stephen, I saw angels. Did you see anybody else? Did you see any people? Now, that's interesting. No, I didn't. <laughs> like, as if you can't talk about the redeemed saints, or are they hiding behind uh, golden thrones or something? No, they're there <laughs> by the multitudes. And uh, so that's why I enjoy talking with those who are prophets. Now, you don't have to be a prophet to have a vision, but um, my prophet friends that, that as we exchange stories, they're like, yeah, I, I, saw, I saw this person or I talked to this person because I've had the same experiences. I, I have been to heaven in visions and I have not only seen redeemed saints because they're, they're, they're there by the millions, if not billions, but... I've also had the privilege to be able to talk to a few. So um, I, I have met even one of the 24 elders, and I've met the Lord Jesus. And uh, probably the greatest experience of my life was meeting the Heavenly Father and going before the throne and having Him uh, speak to me and he even held me. And uh, uh, I would say that was life-changing for me. But my friends, God wants you to also have uh, supernatural experiences, not anything that we would ever try to force or, you know, uh, uh, coerce. Uh, there are many people in New Age, they can, they can uh, put themselves into a trance or they could fabricate uh, certain things. But Jesus said that anyone that comes into the sheep pen uh, without going through the gate is a thief and a robber. So don't ever 
uh, toy around with uh, these areas of occultism because uh, it's one of the fastest ways to pick up a demon, and then you'll have a real problem on your hands. Work with the Holy Spirit. He is the only one that will allow these experiences to take place under his oversight, under his manifesting them through the gifts of the Spirit. By the way, anytime you have a vision, it means the gift of discerning of spirits is operating in your life. Praise God. So my friends, I want to share some things because these are things that I have seen when I have been in heaven and it's what I've looked at and uh, have clearly beheld. And I like that with Peter, when he had a vision, it said that he clearly saw in the vision. And it was like that for me. I wasn't straining to see anything. I'm just looking and enjoying it and uh, watching what the Lord would be sharing with me. So let me share what happened with our first dog that uh, Pastor Kelly and I had. Our first dog, her name was Tabitha. And Tabitha was very special because we had um, thought for a while, hey, let's get a pet. Let's get a dog. But we didn't know what kind we wanted. But we were praying about it. And we happened to see a Walt Disney movie that came out that year. I think it was 1998. And actually, 1996. I see it on my notes there. Uh, it was called 101 Dalmatians, where we watched that movie and uh, didn't really connect with the Dalmatian dog, but there was the rescue dog that rescued all of the little Dalmatian puppies, and that dog was an Airedale Terrier. And the moment we saw that dog, we thought, that's the kind of dog, that, or that, that breed is the dog that we want. So we went on a search, and there were some breeders. And we, at that time, we lived in Southern California, and we found some breeders, and uh, there was one uh, uh, like an hour and a half away, and we drove, and uh, they had some puppies, but the conditions were pretty rough. Um, they were living outside. It was probably about 20 degrees, and there were water puddles everywhere. All the dogs were covered with mud. And there was one sitting over in the corner, a little puppy, shivering and shaking and looking very sad and forlorn. And Kelly saw that little puppy and said, that's the one right there. Well, that was, that was Tabitha. <laughs> and so... Um, at that time, we didn't really know it, but some years later, we would be traveling full-time in a motorhome, preaching all over the country, and we took all of our belongings and put them in storage for years, and we just traveled, and Tabitha was with us in the motorhome, and uh, uh, our daughter was homeschooled, and we were just on the road. By the way, let me pop up a picture of Tabitha, and I think that was probably taken around uh, the year uh, 2001, praise God. She was a really sweet dog, and she was a protector because when we were traveling so much on the road, um, uh, that uh, every every night sometimes was a different place, a different city, and you know you're looking for a place to park. So we would park at different places at night, and sometimes you thought, oh, well, I wish we had maybe a more secure place to park, but you know it's ten o'clock at night. I'm tired driving. We got to stop, and so you'd pull over somewhere, uh, preferably somewhere safe, and th that's what we would always try to do. But Tabitha instinctively would sleep right by the door as a guard dog. And there were times she, she did with that loud bark prevent, obviously something going on outside where uh, there were some su suspicious people uh, checking us out. But, uh, you know, the years just went by and she was like family with us because when you're that close for years in a 30 foot space and you're there, you know, like all, just like all the time, just about everybody gets to know each other really well. And there's a love and it was a sweetness. And even after we phased out of the motor home because uh, it was just too slow and we needed to be able to travel faster in ministry. Whenever we would come home, there's Tabitha and she was always well taken care of. When we would travel, she would be put in a really nice kennel, but she was like a part of the family to us. Uh, but she got old and she lived to be 11 years old. And at the age of 11, uh, she got hit with that thing that really hits terriers. That's hip problems. And her hips began to deteriorate. And, her, and she was also getting real old. Her body was beginning to shut down. And all of that beautiful strength and energy she had when she was young, it was all gone. And she was very old. And she began to get in tremendous arthritic pain. And the vet said, um, Stephen, I suggest that you and Kelly uh, put her to sleep because she's lived a long life 
in, in dog years, and she's in excruciating pain. And so Kelly and I both agreed we needed to put her down, which is the humane thing to do. Remember, these aren't people. These are animals. And um, so you would never put a person down, but uh, an animal out of compassion and love, you don't want to see them in horrible pain. And so we decided to do that. So Kelly said, uh, Stephen, it's too hard for me to be there when this takes place. Please, please, you be the one that goes. I said, okay, I'll do that. And I was thinking, okay, this, this will be okay. Well, I'll get this done and this won't be, this won't be too hard. But I'll tell you when the vet gave her that shot, and Tabitha collapsed in my arms and just that quick she was gone uh, it hit me like a ton of bricks I realized she's gone I saw the life in her you know leave and she's and I'm holding her in my arms and I realized my god she's gone and then then like sudden deep tears and uh and I tell you what it wiped me out for a couple of days wiped Kelly out too because it hit us so hard we realized that she was gone. And it really, really uh, made me sad. Now, I'm going to share something. I want to be honest with you. Um, it, uh, it hit me to a degree where I, I actually allowed myself. I shouldn't have done it. I didn't really understand at that point because I had, hadn't really encountered something like that. But I actually went into grief. And I, I could see how a person could have a, a problem where they might not even be able to pull out. But I got into grief and I was very, very sorrowful. Now, later, the Lord told me, just a few days later, um, he told me, don't, because uh, I, I, I was taken to heaven. Uh, and he also told me at the conclusion of that vision, he said, don't allow yourself to go into grief again. He said, you feel their absence. You feel the hurt, but don't go into grief because you have hope because you belong to me and you're going to see her again. And so that that kind of has allowed me to see all of these things now from a different perspective. Of course, we can know that in our heads, and when the real thing hits, it's still a matter of walking through that. But in that time, I was just wiped out. Kelly and I were wiped out. Um, but it was a few days after that, I had another church service coming up. It was Wednesday night, and uh, we went ahead and did the Wednesday night meeting. And that night, I taught and, you know, just kind of pressed through that. And at the end of the, of the service... I was actually dismissing everybody and uh, was getting, I was actually doing the closing prayer and uh, you know, uh, that was it and that we're going to wrap things up. And right in the middle of that, when it was the dismissal prayer, right in the middle of that, that it looked like everything opened up to me like in a um, 8K giant television monitor screen. And I began to see into heaven. <laughs> And it was totally unexpected, but it was like a phenomenal vision that took place right in front of me. And I just told everybody very calmly, very peacefully, I said, church family, I'm going into a vision right now. God bless you. I'll see you next time. And I just kind of went down on my knees, knelt down, and bowed my head. And I just I kept looking, though. I kept looking, and uh, everybody quietly left. And so I just got caught up in this vision, and I didn't know. From that point on, I didn't know uh, anything about what was going on there in the room or what are people are doing as they leave, because I was, I was totally, at that point, in a completely different realm. Excuse me while I get a little drink of hot tea. And when I saw in the heaven, I saw the area of paradise, and I saw a phenomenal park, when I say big, this, this alone was a dog park. I don't know. Maybe, maybe this dog park was as big as the state of Texas. I, I don't know. But if you could have seen how many dogs were there, you might would think the same thing. And one day you will see it. Praise God. But I saw this dog park. It just went on and on and on. There were dogs like uh, beyond number. Uh, but... I saw a hill, not too far away, not a big hill, kind of like a large mound. Uh, so it's a small hill. And on top of that hill sat Tabitha. And she looked fully restored, all the hair color back, all the muscles back, 
all of the joy and the energy back. And she was sitting on top of that uh, a small hill. And while I was looking at her, she looked beautiful. Uh, she looked very regal. When I was looking at her, the Lord Jesus walked up and stood next to her. And it was strange because she had a, a collar on, but there was a leash, but the leash wasn't hanging down or anything. The leash was actually suspended in the air. It's like a three foot long collar, <laughs> uh, excuse me, a leash, but a three, a collar, but a three foot long leash. There I go. And it was like going up in the air, kind of like, like it was like just staying up by itself. And the Lord walked up to her and he looked over at me and he said something to me. He said, do you see this right here? And he pointed at that leash. I said, yes, Lord. He said, these don't exist here. And the, the leash just like disappeared. Now she still had her collar on, but the leash, there was no leash. And I, I, I could tell there was no dog anywhere that had a leash on. <laughs> and then there was an angel that took a, a, a tennis ball. That was her favorite thing to play with. And he threw it like a mile. I mean, he threw the thing like a mile and Tabitha just took off. Uh, faster than any greyhound, chasing after that tennis ball, just having the time of her life. And, you know, it, it's, it was like a golf course grass, a golf course beauty beyond Pebble Beach, beyond anything you could uh, comprehend on the earthly realm. And so I just watched that for a little bit. And then the Holy Spirit lifted me up and began to take me um, to where our heavenly mansion is at. When I say ours, I'm talking about me and my wife, Kelly. And that, that, that statement also has uh, caused me to have a lot of emails. <laughs> I've had a lot of uh, 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 people, uh, believers whose spouse has died, and, they're, and they so miss their spouse, and they've asked me, will I see my spouse when I get to heaven? Can we live together? Uh, that's a different subject. I'll save that for a different time. But I was taken to the mansion that I knew belonged to me and my wife. And so uh, I arrived at the outside of the mansion and was taken in. And when I was taken in, I was just, I'm, I was loving this because this was like me. The, the floors, the walls, there was granite. It looked like granite or mar some areas marble, some areas granite. There was uh, marble going up the walls. There was w wood. Uh, and so th there were two angels. They met me there. And one of them did like this to me, which the universal sign of be quiet. He put his finger over his lips. And, you know, and he didn't say anything, but it was, it was like, you know, shh, you know, like that. I, so, you know, I, I, I was thinking in my mind, okay, okay, I got it. And so those two angels took me down a hallway in my heavenly mansion. And that hallway, when we got to the end of it, it opened up into like a, a personal library, like a reading room. And when I, and I was, I was not allowed to go in there, but I was allowed to look in there. And I kind of just leaned and looked in. And when I looked in, I saw bookshelves. Hallelujah. How many of you know I like to read and write? I saw bookshelves, uh, leather books bound, very beautiful. I saw um, uh, tables with, uh, it looked like glass vases with beautiful flower arrangements. It's hard to explain it because all of it is like amped to another level of luxury and beauty and, and glory because it's in a perfect uh, world. It's in a perfect place. And then I saw a, a giant fireplace. It had a beautiful mantle over it. How many of you know I like mantles? Amen. And then as my eyes came down, there was a beautiful wool rug in front of that fireplace and laying on it was Tabitha. And she was taking a nap. Now, what had happened during that time um, where earlier there was like tennis or playtime, and now she's back at my heavenly mansion, it seemed like uh, there was a shift in the day. And it didn't get dark because it never gets dark in heaven. There's no shadows anywhere. There's no darkness. But there was like a shift towards like a, what we would call like an evening contemplative quiet time. The colors went from brilliant uh, to more like subdued pinks, like cotton candy powder blues, and real soft colors where you would want to sit by a fire, maybe relax. Well, she was napping 
on that uh, beautiful lambskin uh, wool rug. And she was laying on her side, and she had a golden collar on her neck. But now I could, I could I was close enough, I could read it. And it was in cursive writing. It was a solid gold collar that was somehow still comfortable. And it said, in cursive writing, it said, Tabitha Brooks, going around it. <laughs> and when I saw that, I almost came undone. But the angels could see that really hit me with the love of God. And they, they gently kind of pulled me back, and they took me back out of down the hallway, back out of the mansion, and then the whole vision began to lift. It began to lift. And the next thing I knew, I looked around, I'm back in the, uh, the room where we had had the church service and all the lights were out. I was there all by myself. Pastor Kelly told me later that she was the last one out. She had locked the door and uh, everybody reverently had left and gone home. I'm sure, you know, they were wondering, uh, they were wanting to hear what had happened the next meeting. But um, I was there by myself and I just began to worship and thank the Lord that he is so good. His mercies are so tender. He's so sweet. You know, it says in the book of Job, um, there's a very beautiful scripture, Job chapter 12, verse 7. It says, ask the animals and they will teach you. Well, now, Pastor Stephen, what's an animal going to teach me? The thing that God has designed our pets to teach us, which is what? Love. They, they teach you how to love. And that's what I came away with. I said, my God. I said, she taught me, that dog in many ways taught me how to love because of her sweetness and, and patience. There's no perfect pet, but in many ways it's like she was. And she brought nothing but joy to Pastor Kelly and I. Did she bark a lot? Yeah, the dog barked a lot, but it didn't bother us. <laughs> it kind of made us happy. Amen. Uh, but that's my story of Tabitha. You know, um, once I was in Jakarta, Indonesia, and I felt the Holy Spirit wanted me to share uh, the vision of when I saw Tabitha in heaven. And I just shared that story. And then when I was done, the host said to me, Oh, Pastor Stephen, you must share this with somebody. Uh, he said, I'm going to get this person here tomorrow. He said, the person lives in Hong Kong. So that night he called the person in Hong Kong and said, you must get here. You must fly to Indonesia. You must get here tomorrow morning and hear this story of Pastor Stephen's vision of having gone to heaven and seen his dog. And I asked the host, I said, why is it so important? He said, Pastor Stephen, this man's uh, Doshin, wiener dog, died 25 years ago, and he is still in a depression. He has been depressed ever since the day the doggy died, and he's never pulled out of it. And well, guess what? The next morning, he was there. He had caught an overnight flight. He, he went out immediately, bought the ticket, caught the overnight flight, and uh, the next day, the host and this dear man were at my hotel door and uh, knocking on the door. I said, come in. And the host said, Pastor Stephen, here's my friend. Uh, could you please tell him the vision that you saw? And I did. And when I shared it, it brought, it, it, it brought to his heart closure. He had never had closure because he thought it was over. He thought he'll never see his beloved little pet again. I said, oh, no, that pet's in heaven waiting for you. <laughs> and it lifted all of that depression and sadness and really hopelessness off of him, and it brought closure to him for the first time in 25 years. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, the second pet that Pastor Kelly and I had is Truffles, a Welsh terrier. But let me come back to Truffles in a minute, okay? I'm going to skip her for a moment, and I want to uh, tell you what happened actually right here in this very building that I'm at. This is uh, my internet studio number two, but this is also in the fellowship hall, and something special happened right here when my wife was working uh, late one night, and it was winter. I was actually over in the sanctuary, so I didn't know what was going on, but she was, my wife Kelly was here with our daughter, Abigail, 
and it was drizzly outside, way below freezing, and um, just yucky weather outside. But we were working late that night, so um, Kelly is in her office working, and she hears like a, a sound at the door, like a, like a scratching sound. And she thought, well, I wonder what that could be. So she gets up out of her chair, walks over to the door, and looks through the security window and doesn't see anything. She decides to open it just a few inches to kind of peek out and see what it could be. And when she opened the door just a few inches, three little puppies bolted through that little opening and ran into the fellowship hall and they ran right into her office. <laughs> so Kelly goes into her office and there's those three little puppies. Kelly sits down in the chair and one of them jumps into her lap. And Kelly and Abigail looked at that little puppy and they both like at the same time said, my goodness, she's beautiful. Now, all three of them were, were cute, but this one was just like really, really beautiful. So the other two we took to the pet adoption center here in town so they could get adopted, but we kept this one. And this one we named Duchess. And we found something uh, very unusual that we began to understand. Anytime you rescue an animal and that animal knows it's about to die, Anytime you save that animal, they'll never forget it. They'll always know they owe their life to you because you rescued them. And we found out that this dog poured out so much love and sweetness into our lives that one day I told my wife, I said, I don't, I said, I never even knew that an animal could demonstrate love like this. And uh, it was such sweetness and love that this dog brought to us in a different way than Tabitha. They, they were both unique, but this one, because she was rescued, really just, uh, just poured out love all the time. You know, Jesus rescued us. We were on our way to hell, lost in sin, and Jesus rescued us. We put our trust in him, and he reached down and saved us out of the hell that we were headed towards. Praise God forever. And of course, anybody that really understands that, you pour out love upon the Lord to whom much has been forgiven. Much love is just lavished upon the uh, rescuer. <laughs> and so uh, this dog was uh, such a joy. And it was interesting because we didn't know what kind of a breed she was. She would be like what the locals call a Heinz 57, which is like a, a, a mixture of a little bit of everything. But I, I began to get a lot of comments as she grew up. People would say, wow, what a beautiful dog. One time I took her because we were traveling uh, out of country to a, a kennel in Charlotte, uh, a very nice kennel, beautiful place. And, you know, there's hundreds of dogs there. But the head guy over the whole kennel, said, Stephen, what an absolutely beautiful dog. What kind of dog is Duchess? You know, like what breed? I said, you know, I don't know. So I actually went out and uh, purchased one of those uh, uh, $19, 1999 uh, dog DNA test kit and ran the test on her. And it came out that she uh, she's uh, composed of four different breeds, two which are very uh, normal and plain, but two also that are very, very rare. So that that combination mix produced a very unusual dog. Let me pop a picture of uh, Duchess up on the screen for you. She was so much fun. But we had her for, for I believe it was, yes, seven years. And after seven years, she, um, of course, was still young and, and very healthy and as far as beauty. But we could tell she was in pain. She lost the happiness, the joy, because something was causing her pain. We took her to the vet, and the vet just ran the standard test, and, you know, you wait for the exam to come back. And the, the, the vet called us back three days later and said, Stephen and Kelly, I hate to tell you this, but um, Duchess is eaten up with cancer in her throat and in her mouth. And we're like, ah, oh, that's why she stopped eating. And, of course, she was also in severe pain, and the cancer was very aggressive. Well, Pastor Stephen, did you pray for her? Yes, I did, but God didn't heal her. You know what the Lord spoke to me? He said, let her come home to be with me. And 
I tried to pray for her again, but the Lord, the, the anointing, God's power would not go in to her, uh, her body. And the Lord spoke again, let her come home to me. And she had already lived a beautiful life. Uh, you know, she, she shouldn't have even been alive anyhow. We rescued her. And so she had seven phenomenal years. And uh, we put her to sleep there at the vet. And she went, you know, she got the shot. And uh, it ended all of that tremendous pain that she was in because the cancer was eating her up. And she collapsed in Kelly's arms. And again, wow, that hit us like a ton of bricks. We didn't get in the grief, but wow, that one hurt bad. And uh, we were just like, oh, God, she was, uh, she's gone. And she was so loving and sweet. that Yeah, it, we no grief, but wow, yeah, we really missed her. We really loved her. And uh, one day I, I was just hurting. And I went to the, this was just like two days after she had passed away. And I went over to the, the sanctuary. And uh, I said, Lord, would you speak to me? I said, I know you will. You've, you've taken me to heaven and you've let me, have, I've, I saw Tabitha. And I know you'll do something to bring comfort. But I said, would you speak to me? And I sat there in the sanctuary for maybe about an hour, just, uh, you know, talking to the Lord. And then I thought in my heart, well, it would be good to praise the Lord, to worship the Lord. And I began to sing some songs to the Lord. And I tried that for about 20 minutes. And after about 20 minutes, I just gave up because I was too sad. And I said, Lord, I'm so sad. I can't even sing. I said, I'm sorry, but I can't, I can't even, I can't do it. I'm just absolutely wiped out because uh, of the loss of her. She's gone. And I got up and walked out of the sanctuary and walked into the parking lot here of our church. And when I walked outside with a heavy heart, I happened to look up, and my friends, when I looked up, I saw a cloud form, and in, in this cloud, it formed the perfect face of the Lord Jesus, but it was different. It was Jesus revealing himself to me as the suffering Savior. I've seen him on the cross a few times before. He's allowed me to see that in visionary experiences. But this time, the whole cloud was up there. It was a gigantic cloud. Formed the face of Jesus, the suffering Savior. I could see the crown of thorns on his head. I could see the blood dripping down on his face. I could see his beard had been ripped out, and his flesh was torn to pieces. And he had a look of grief and sorrow on his face. And when I... When I kept looking at his face, he's, he, he was sucking the anguish of that death, of the passing of Duchess, out of me, all of the pain. He was sucking it supernaturally out of me because he took all of those griefs and pains, and he has conquered death, and he was pulling every single bit out of me. I looked at his face in awe for about two or three minutes, and then I did, I did something. I knew it wasn't going to work. I knew that this experience was solely for me. And I did something. I knew it wasn't going to work. And I ran from the parking lot to the fellowship hall. I knew it would take me about 20 seconds to get there. And I ran. The whole time I was running, I knew I was doing it in the flesh. Because I knew that was for me only. But I ran to the fellowship hall grab the door, open it up, and, and yell, Kelly, quick, come outside and see this. And she came out and said, what? I, I said, look. She said, my goodness, it's the Lord. And it, it, it faded away. The, whole, the moment she looked up, it was already fading out, and it was gone in 10 seconds. She didn't see it like I did. But the Lord was telling me, even when I was running, it's only for you. It's only for you. <laughs> Why does she do that? I don't know. But I have found that there is a grace that God has given me where I can, I can go up at times to see things that others, perhaps, for whatever reason, may not have that grace to see, but I can see it and then relay to them at least what I saw to bring closure for them. Amen. But it, seeing him in anguish, in agony, see the, the thorns, those thorns were that long or longer 
were rammed into his, through his skull, into his brain with inexpressible pain and agony. So he bore our griefs, these deep sorrows. He bore them and just looking at him sucked all of that out of me. And I was like, she's with you. She's with you. We're, it's cool, Lord. Everything's good. And I was happy. <laughs> Woo, do I miss her? Yes. But I knew I would see her again. Praise God. The Lord is good. I want to talk a little bit more. I'm sharing these things because of emails I've received recently of people that have their precious pets that are just about to pass. And I know what they're facing. And I know others also who maybe don't know these biblical things I'm sharing with you of how good God is. And so I want to get the word out. Praise God. I believe it's a timely word. Now, let's go on to the next one. Two more I want to share with you. The next precious animal that showed up on the scene was one that I felt was sent by the Lord to my house. I was at my home one day and I looked out the window. This was two years ago, two and a half years ago. I looked out the window and I saw a cat, kitty cat go by that looked like he was on his last leg. What I mean by that is he looked like he, he was skin and bones. He looked like he probably couldn't live maybe three more weeks maximum. And I said, Kelly, I said, I'm seeing a feral cat, a stray cat that um, obviously is homeless. Looks like he's not going to make it. We better get him some food. So she and I went to the pet store, bought some kitty cat dishes, filled them up with food, put out fresh water. And the next day, sure enough, he found it and he started eating them. Uh, excuse me, started eating the food but he was, he was wild. Um, one time I actually watched him to see after he ate where he would go back to his hiding place was because we have a lot of woods towards the back area of our, our house. So one day I followed him from a distance. He couldn't see me. I followed him and I found out where he was living. He was living in a drainage ditch that goes into a culvert and, uh, which is like a pipe underground uh, it was about that that big, maybe like a foot opening, and that's where he was living at, the poor little fellow. And um, so I made a little nest of straw for him outside of the house. It was winter time, and sure enough, he started laying down in the straw at night, and he wanted to be close to the house. And it took me a couple of weeks of feeding him and talking real sweet to him uh, before we could actually get close enough where one day I could touch him. And one day he finally let me pet him. And uh, he was still skin and bones, but he's eating, so he's, at least he's starting to get some strength back. And as the Lord is my witness, that day when I touched him for the first time, I heard music start to play in, in the background. There was music back behind me that started playing, and I heard a beautiful male voice with like a with like a, a symphony backing this person up singing the song that was written by Michael W. Smith called Friends Are Friends Forever. <laughs> I actually heard that and I looked at that little kitty cat and I named him Simon Peter because cats like fish and P Peter was a fisherman. I said, Simon Peter, from this day forward, you're going to be you're going to be a friend to me. We'll be friends forever. And you're going to be like a little son to me. And so uh, that music played for about a minute or two and it stopped. Some of you have heard that uh, world famous song. Um, how does it go? Friends are friends forever when the Lord's the Lord of them. And it goes on. It's just, a, it's like, in other words, when God puts friends together, they're friends forever in him because this is an eternal thing. But anyhow, I always knew in my heart that this little guy would not live long, but me and Kelly took him to the vet, got him his shots, got him cleaned up, and, uh, and, and the vet said, yeah, he, he wouldn't have made it through the winter. He was almost gone for, but he lived for two more years. Let me put a picture up of Simon Peter. I won't put a picture up of when we first met him because it's too, it's too uh, tragic. He looked horrible. Um, but here's a picture of Simon Peter. And remember, he was a rescued animal. 
What does that usually end up uh, having? Uh, an animal that absolutely loves you and adores you like crazy. So every time I got home, he would be outside to meet me. When I'd pull up, he'd come running out to meet me. And then when I come in, he'd go up with me to my office. Whenever I would sit, read my Bible, pray and meditate, he's either holding on to my foot or laying on my leg or sitting right next to me. He absolutely loved Kelly and I. But then after about two years, Kelly and I noticed he wasn't, he stopped eating. Something was wrong. We took him to the doctor uh, and, the, and to the vet, and she did the test, and she said, Stephen, he has cancer, and it's, and it's already eaten him up in a large portion area of his insides. I said, well, the poor little guy, he, uh, we just knew something was wrong. But see, I always knew he wasn't going to live very long. Well, I tried praying for him too. Lord Jesus, heal him in the name of Jesus. But the anointing wouldn't go in. And the Lord spoke to me and said, let him come home with me. I'll take care of him. I said, oh Lord, this one I really love because this one came to me. This one ran to me. And so he and I were like, there was like a real love there. But the Lord said, let him come home to me. So we took him to the vet and uh, put him to sleep because he was also in tremendous pain and uh, put him to sleep. And so uh, I want to tell you in just a moment what happened to Simon Peter. But in order to do that, I now want to loop back to Truffles. Now, remember, Truffles was our second dog, but she lived for nine years. And because of that, uh, she was still alive when there was Duchess. She was still alive when there was Simon Peter. So those precious animals passed on, but we still had Truffles. She was going long haul with us. And uh, Truffles was a lot of fun. She was a Welch Terrier. Here's a, a picture of Truffles. Uh, Welch Terriers love to climb. There's something inside of them where they want to get to the highest point, whether it's on your office table or on your kitchen countertop. Uh, so they love to dig because they were bred to, you know, dig out rabbits and to, you know, hunt for vermin and things like that. So they're a very, very quirky breed of dogs. And uh, Truffles was like that. She was very hard to understand. But once you understood her nature, you, uh, I remember when Kelly and I began to understand her. We're like, this dog is a genius. Because <laughs> initially you would think she's stubborn. But then you realize, no, she's actually very very smart. So she was a lot of fun. And she, you know, of course, was with us with uh, uh, the other precious pets. And uh, Truffles was very precious. But as she got to the age of nine, she began to have this, a little bit of the same problems that terriers have, which was uh, the hip problems. But she, um, she had another internal problem where she got hit real hard real fast. And again, we had to put her to sleep because of the tremendous pain that she was in. She was in so much pain that despite how much she loved us, she would actually growl, get real upset if you moved her because she was in such severe pain. So finally, after nine wonderful years, we had to take her and put her to sleep. And Kelly and I were both there. Kelly was there when the vet gave her the shot, put her to sleep, and she you know, fell into uh, Pastor Kelly's arms. And all of the precious, wonderful memories, boom, hit you so hard, hit you so hard again. No matter how many times you've been through it, whenever there's genuine love, uh, it hits you really, really hard. And so, um, you know, she's now been put to sleep. And it was, a, it was a few days after that where I had a tremendous experience with the Lord. Praise God. I was, in, uh, I was in prayer, and I went into a vision, and the Lord took me to heaven. And this was amazing. When I, because I, heaven is so big, it's a lot of different places. This time when I went to heaven, I saw there on a riverbank, a beautiful, uh, like a, uh, it was like a small, looked like a small river, and I saw an embankment, a phenomenal-looking grass. So there's there's the river, and then there's the embankment, and then up here would be the top part where the grass is now level. And sitting on the top of the grass, right next to the embankment, were you ready for this? 
Number one, there was Tabitha. I hadn't seen her in years. Number two, there was Truffles. Number three, there was Duchess. And then number four was Simon Peter, the kitty cat. And they're all four sitting together. And I'm standing with an angel a little ways back watching them. They did not see me. And the Lord would not allow me to go any closer or to see them. But I was looking at them. There uh, in front of them on that beautiful river were some swan white swan, and they were just phenomenally beautiful. And from time to time, people would travel up and down, heavenly redeemed saints would travel up and down that river, and they would look up at my animals, and they would say, those belong to the Brooks family. Those are the Brooks's pets. <laughs> I could hear them say that. <laughs> and they knew whose pets those were. Okay, at, at this point, the Lord backs my peripheral vision back. So I, it's like everything got expanded out more. And when things were enlarged of my view, I suddenly realized more of what I was looking at. I, I almost wanted to shout because I realized that this river, because it was small, was not actually the main river. It was a tributary that was flowing off of the main river of life written of in the Bible in the book of Revelation. So you have the main uh, river itself, the river of life, but there's tributaries that go in different places. And this was a tributary just right off the river of life. And they were sitting up on that embankment watching all this activity because there's a lot going on in the main river. Wow, I looked at this. And then, oh God, hallelujah. I, I screamed with joy. I got so excited because all the... The Holy Spirit made me to understand that our mansion is just right over there. So they were very close to where our heavenly home is at. So the Holy Spirit revealed to me that this is what my pets do sometimes during the daytime. The angel comes and takes them there to the riverbank and they are content to sit there sometimes all day long. And what was amazing is that, you know, cats and dogs very, very rarely would get along. Uh, either, you know, got to separate them, give them some distance. Sometimes they can. Depends on the breeds. But though all four of my pets were so calm that, that even Simon Peter was just laying there. And they all knew that they were a family group, that they were knit together in the love of God. And they belonged to each other. And they belonged to Kelly and myself. And, oh, it was just, it was um, so much of God's love, I felt. Um, and at the same time, as I'm saying, the Holy Spirit was showing me something. Let me preface this by saying this. One time, my wife and I were in London, and we left London, and we went to Oxford, England. And we took the train. And there was a point on the train where we went past one of these little English villages, that uh, I saw something that's like forever etched in my mind. We went past one of these villages and I saw a small village and a house to me that was so beautiful and there was a river going by it, and there were swans there in the water and because I'm on a train and I saw it and it only lasted maybe five seconds but it was an unforgettable memory in my mind because I thought to me that was the most beautiful place I'd ever seen on the earth having been privileged by the Lord to visit many different countries that five second image of that little English college home was just like heaven to me well, what I saw when I was watching my four pets and that tributary coming off the river of the life, the tributary I could see led to what looked like an English cottage. Now, this is outside of the city of heaven, but it led to an English cottage, and I knew that Kelly and I's mansion was there in that cottage, and that's where my dogs had uh, and kitty cat had uh, been brought from because they, they were obviously close by to where our house is at. I got so excited, I screamed with joy. <laughs> Woo, glory to God. Hallelujah. And then the Holy Spirit turned my attention towards the heavenly city. And I knew by, by supernatural knowing 
that Bill, Bill Hart, Kelly's father, who I had the privilege uh, of leading to Jesus, an old Irishman who immigrated to America and made his way successful and raised a family in America, I, but he never lost his thick Irish accent, never lost his Irish uh, identity. I knew that he was in the city, in the, in the heavenly city, uh, uh, doing some activities uh, that day, and I knew they were also Irish-related. <laughs> I said, oh, my God. I said, Lord, Bill's there, isn't he? He's having a really good time today. He's doing something even Irish. And it was such a happy, happy thing. Praise God. Amen. And then it began to fade out. And it, the vision began to lift. And I'm back. I'm back where I was at, spending time with the Lord in prayer. Wow. Praise God. What a beautiful Jesus. What a beautiful plan. Hallelujah. And my friends, God... God has a miracle for you. If you have a, had a pet that's passed away, but you want to have that pet in heaven, that pet will be there waiting for you. Look at this beautiful scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Amen. You know, I've always known that it was a reality that there are our pets in heaven. Uh, but until I had these visionary experiences, I never had a, how can I say, a, a more weight applied to that. You know, when I was um, in my 20s, when Kelly and I had gotten married, uh, I was asked to be, uh, the president of a chapter of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International. And so Kelly and I ran that for over a year. We had our meetings there in Irvine, California, which at that time happened to be where the world headquarters was at. So because we met every week and we were right next to the world headquarters, we got some of the most phenomenal speakers, world-class ultra wealthy businessmen, business women. It was just, uh, and God was saving people. Miracles were happening. It was a beautiful thing. But my treasurer, uh, who was a very godly man, his wife uh, was a prophetess. Now at that time they were in their eighties and their lives would, uh, would end just a few years later as they would end their li lives out and go on to be with the Lord through, um, just old age. But Henry was my treasurer. Maya was uh, his wife. And Maya was very influential as a, a woman of God. Uh, when Demas Shakarian really needed to, to get a confirming word on something that he believed that he was hearing from God, he would go to Maya. Maya was also the woman that God sent to the sign business of a man named Gary Greenwald and told him, you're supposed to get out of this business and you're supposed to start a church. And you know what he said? He said, the only way I'll get out of this is if God bankrupts this business. And well, God bankrupted his business. <laughs> and he went on to start a church that grew to about 4,000 members. And uh, he ended up becoming my pastor and a great spiritual mentor. But she's the woman that God used in that. So what would happen sometimes is that after our luncheon meetings were over with these uh, chapter meetings, uh, I would sit around and I would ask Maya questions about heaven because she was a prophetess. And she told me one of the stories that happened to her when she was taken to heaven on a certain occasion, and she was allowed to meet her father. Now, her father, of course, was a Christian man, a good man, and he had died years before he was in heaven, but she was allowed, she was allowed to meet him. So she was taken in a vision in her spirit to heaven, and uh, she met her father, and her uh, father said, I want you to come see where I live, and um, she went to his home. Now, she said, um, this was very interesting because in heaven, there are what we would call the proverbial mansions. There are homes that go beyond description because um, everything is just so beautiful, and there's, there's homes that are gigantic. Well, she said when she got to her father's place, he had what we would call, from an earthly perspective, he had more of what we would call like a condominium, like a real nice townhome. 
but she she did say that when she was there when she when he they went inside there running around you know his home was the little bitty family dog that she had grown up with when she was a child and you know of course he explained yes your your pets are here in heaven and you know if you love them and you want to have them yeah they they're here waiting for you but she also said um she presented her father with the question how come so many people have mansions but you have like a like a town home he said maya he said i never told you this while you were on the earth but the whole time i lived on the earth god called me into the ministry and he wanted me to be a pastor but i never did it i never obeyed him so he he stayed in secular work which there's nothing wrong with that that's where god called you to be more power to you and that's where your anointing and blessing will be but god called him into the ministry and he, and he told by his daughter he said i never obeyed i never did it so he said because of my disobedience while i was on the earth and uh you know not producing rewards and not having lived my life for god when I got here, this is what I have. I don't have a big mansion. I don't. I, I was not uh, a person that had rewards because I lived for the Lord on the earth. He said I lived for myself, and I never served the Lord in the sense where I obeyed Him uh, by doing what He had asked me to do. That's why I have this little bitty condominium. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. But my friends, heaven is still beautiful. Everybody's happy, and your pets will be there. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Here's one more scripture. Let's close with this one. This, of course, is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. Uh, and when he says ignorant, he's not talking about not being smart, but just uh, about not being informed or not spiritually having a, a knowledge of this. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. I just want to speak words of comfort to anybody that might be hurting, especially during Christmas time, during the holidays, through the loss of a pet. I want you to know that you can see that pet again in heaven, that pet, kitty, cat, dog, sheep, horse, whatever it might be, will be there waiting for you. Praise God. Now, if it's a horse, probably can't keep the horse there in your heavenly mansion. But you have to understand also there are homes in heaven because heaven is a city. Okay, but there's also homes that are outside of it. Maybe you want to think of it as uh, suburbs. That's where the area where my wife and I's mansion would be. It'd be more like a suburb outside of the main city because you can go through the city anytime that you want to. Praise the Lord. Glory, glory to God. My friends, there's only one condition in order to see your pets in heaven is that you have to be born again because you can only go to heaven if you are a Christian. Okay, so if you're watching today, and maybe you just clicked on this message because you're curious about uh, what the message would be, and, but you really loved your pet, and you want to see your pet again, you have to have your life right with God. Okay, so I want to pray for you right now. For anyone that would not know the Lord, pray this prayer, but you, but you want to get your life right with God. You want to see your pet again. Pray this prayer right now. Say, Lord Jesus... I completely surrender my life to you. Please forgive me of all my sins. Wash me with your precious blood. I believe that you died on the cross and that you were buried and that you have risen again to be my Savior. Jesus, save me now. Write my name in your book of life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much for saving me. In your name I pray, O oh God. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Welcome to the family of God. <laughs> and yes, you can now see your pet again too when you go to heaven. Praise the Lord. And who knows, you might have a bunch more. Amen. My, my wife and I, we've got, we've got some more years. Amen. Or until the Lord comes back at least. And uh, 
the, the Lord has sent us or the angels have directed to our home two more little, little uh, furry friends. Let me pop them up on the screen uh, real quick as you're taking a look now at Onyx and Opal. Praise God. Amen. Total feral, never wild. They have still never been touched by any human ever in their life. We have been feeding them now for about about four months, and they were just um, uh, left left to their own, totally out in the wild. Uh, but we put some food out when we saw them, and uh, they are growing up beautiful. We feed them every day, talk to them. Amen. And the Lord brought them. Hallelujah. And they make my wife and I happy. Amen. There's more room on the riverbank. Praise God. Hallelujah. But my friends, let us, let us love the Lord who has rescued us. Let us understand what Jesus did for us that no other person could ever, ever do. He loves, he loves you so much. Amen. He's going to make your wildest dreams come true because again, it's all because of his great love for us. All right. So let's, let's celebrate the Lord. Let's take Holy communion together. Praise God. Let's thank him for his precious gifts. And maybe there's somebody watching today and you're a little rough around the edges, but you love animals. Let the sweetness come through. If, if there is an area where there's judgment or mercy, I know sometimes we have to be real strong and maybe even go with judgment, but if possible, try to show as much mercy as possible, even as you're doing what you have to do. Let the, the kindness of the Lord, the sweetness, the goodness of the Lord be very strong qualities in your Christian life. You know, there was a man one time that when he was a little boy, he had a pet lamb, and he absolutely loved that lamb. Just like Nathan told the story to King David, he absolutely loved that little lamb. It was, it was his life because his father was abusive. His father was an alcoholic, beating. And, uh, and so that was his consolation with this, this little lamb that he had. Well, one day, in front of his own eyes, his father, in a, in a drunken rage, took the lamb in his hands and killed it and smashed it and killed it right in front of this little child. And it traumatized him. And he became bitter and full of rage and anger towards everything, anyone, anybody that would represent authority. He was in and out of prison. He was drugs, guns, anything. He just went wild with rage because he, he didn't know God. But one day, years later, as a full-grown man with a criminal record a mile long, a hardened criminal, and in trouble all the time, somebody invited him to church and he went to church for the first time in his life. And when he went, the pastor preached spontaneously by the Holy Spirit. The pastor preached on the spotless Lamb of God, whose blood was shed and who, who, whose life was laid down for the redemption of mankind. And that man understood that that precious little lamb that he had was a representation of Jesus, the spotless lamb of God. And when the pastor told that story and asked for those that were not saved to come and receive Jesus, the lamb of God, that man came to Christ that day. Amen. So today, let's take the bread and the juice and let's pray over it. Amen. Father, we just thank you. We bless the bread and the juice. We set it apart as being holy. We thank you that this is the body and the blood of Jesus. And Father, we thank you for the Lamb of God, innocence, purity. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, oh God, for saving us. <laughs> oh God, we'll never really comprehend it, but we certainly do want to show our thanksgiving for all that Jesus has done for us. Father, we now receive the Lord's body with great admiration and appreciation for his rescuing us. Thank you. When nobody else would or could, we thank you, Father, for Jesus. Amen. Let's receive his body together. Praise the Lord. 
Father, thank you for the precious blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God. Glory, glory. Father, if anyone has sinned against us, we forgive them, we bless them, and we move on in you. We thank you for your joy, your strength. We thank you that we are ready for heaven, and one day we will be there. But for now, we must live for you, and we must walk through this fallen world. But Father, we thank you that you're with us. Greater is he that is in us, your Holy Spirit, than he that is in the world. And we thank you that you have nothing but victory for us, goodness for us, and we give you all of the praise. Thank you, Father, for the blood of Jesus. We receive it now. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's drink together. Praise God. God's going to send some people across your, your way, your path, that might look irredeemable, unrepairable, broken, and unfixable. But he wants you to know that if you'll reach out with his love and just do your part, share the good news with them, share Jesus with them, then God can rescue any lost soul. Amen. But he needs you to be the lifeline. He's the salvation uh, life preserver that you can throw out, but he's got to work through a person. He's the head, but we're the body. Praise God. So let him work through you because there's going to some, some people going to come across your path. Maybe they're, maybe they are addicted to the most awful drugs, fentanyl, crystal meth, or heroin, or whatever it might be. And you might think there's no hope with Jesus. There is. Praise God. Maybe you come across somebody that's just a, a whoremonger, just totally immoral. But you know what? Maybe they've never heard the gospel. Maybe they're just walking in their father's sins, and this is the only life they know. But you can speak a word, and God can reach that hard heart. Praise God. Father, we give you praise. We thank you that during Christmas, many people are actually often hurting. While there's a lot of merry and laughter and a lot of joy and a lot of eggnog being drunk uh, and a lot of lattes being made, there's a lot of hurting people. Father, we just thank you. Let there be rescuers in Zion. Let your people be sensitive while they drink their eggnog. Let them be sensitive of those that could be on their final leg. And we thank you. There's going to be remarkable rescues, <laughs> and we'll see them one day in heaven. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. Thank you. Thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name. Father, bless your people with a beautiful week in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. My friends, thank you for watching. I look forward to seeing you back next time. Bye-bye.